we would like to begin by acknowledging and honoring with gratitude that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of First Nation elders and peoples who have lived and continue to live here and care for these lands. Uh, there's just a couple of things I would like to say before we get into the agenda. And that is for those who are not familiar with the Zoom application, um, I would just ask that if you're not speaking, you mute your microphone. And I will, if you want to say something, if you would please raise your hand, that's in the, uh, if you have the participants up, it's in the bottom right corner where it says raise hand. Uh, and I will acknowledge uh, uh, and recognize you uh, at, uh, uh, when you when you are wanting to speak. I'll try and keep uh, records of who's wanting to speak first. The other thing I would like to say is that um, we really appreciate um, the City of Grand Forks and our staff for um, uh, uh, assisting us in um, in, in, in hosting this uh, meeting. And I would also um, uh, like to say that we're gonna keep this uh, to a tight timeline and we're going to be exiting uh, or uh, adjourning at, uh, at uh, three o'clock and at the outside 3.15. So having said that, I would like to ask for a resolution if, or if there are any uh, late items to be added to the agenda. And Councillor Maudlin and then Councillor, or then um, John DeHaan. Yes, Chair, J just to, to notify the meeting uh, about the meeting being recorded. Uh, oh, yes. I, I think most people can now see in their upper left, uh, it's being recorded. I, I, I we have often invited the public to our meetings and that, that's how it's always been. Uh, uh, so that is the intent to record, is to make it publicly available. I, I don't know if there's a motion necessary, Chair, or if the meeting will just let us go on with uh, uh, common consent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, if anybody, uh, John DeHaan had his hand raised. You're uh, muted, John. You're muted, John. Nope, now you're still muted. <laughs> you, you're muted. You keep muting and unmuting yourself. Uh, um, count, Councillor, um, just quickly, um, we have we have three uh, different phone callers calling in as well, um, okay. and 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 some members that are joining us are simply labeling themselves user. Uh, it would really help if if people could re either rename themselves or or let you possibly know um, who they are under the phone numbers. Uh, that would help, and also if everybody could possibly mute their their microphones that's not speaking at the time thank you okay john um you have to unmute yourself please john you're you're muted hello can you hear me now yes okay thank you sorry there was a little glitch there um yeah i'd like to speak to the um um recording of the meeting before we start um, I want to call on the chair to rule on a point of order, please. And this stems from the last meeting. I think this could be fairly simple. The reason I'm asking for a point of order is because that way, um, according to Robert's rules, the uh, chair can rule without debate. Um, that's with regard to the uh, chat function um, on the Zoom application here. Um, it was brought to my attention at the last meeting um, that uh, members of the assembly were um, using the chat meeting simultaneous, uh, simultaneously while the meeting was in uh, session. Uh, that said, um, according to Robert's rules, I know it's, it's probably vague with regard to a Zoom meeting, but I'd like to establish this before we uh, start. I'd like to ask the chair to rule that 
either we agree not to use the chat function or that we have the moderator shut off the chat function because um, in my interpretation of Robert's rules, uh, this would constitute a member speaking out of turn. And uh, I find it highly um, inappropriate. And uh, it's not like we need two meetings going at the same time. So my view is that any um, issue that is on the table is up for debate. And um, any comments relevant to the debate are of course, um, available for members to comment on, and there should be no sidebar conversations going on to detract from the meeting. So I ask the chair to rule on that, please. Um, I would uh, like to hear uh, and, and request our um, corporate officer, Daniel Drexler, yeah. to assist me in this regard, please. Yeah, I, I can easily turn off the chat function on our end. Uh, it, it's, it definitely could be construed as messaging each other behind the scenes. Um, this doesn't happen in a normal meeting, right? Um, so I, I would support it and I can easily turn that function off. Then I would ask you to please turn the chat function off. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Chair. Okay, taken care of. Okay, so uh, any late items to add to the agenda? Hearing none, may I have a, a resolution to adopt the agenda as presented? Uh, I'd ask for a resolution to that effect. Um, uh, Mr. Smith uh, was waving hand there. I, I don't know how many uh, icons or screens you have on, on yours there, Councillor. I've got 19, I think. Yeah, so, so Mr. Mr. Smith, uh, Gary here, he was, he was raising his hand for putting a motion forward. Okay, then uh, I would ask for a seconder on that, please. So moved, this is Kathy Hutton. Okay, so Kathy, you're seconding and I appreciate that. Uh, are there any errors or omissions? Okay, hearing none. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. I think I was ahead of myself. We're, um, next item is the, uh, the minutes of the April 29th meeting. <clears throat> and um, I would ask if there are any errors or omissions in that, uh, in those minutes. I have a question. This is Kathy again. Okay. Uh, there's under reports from table members, they were talking about, or pardon me, Miranda was talking about um, getting back to school and on, on the first page. And it says that uh, she suggested that any transmission would be any transition would begin with the younger children as they are not considered vectors for the disease. Now it's been brought to light that children can get COVID. So I'm wondering if this has changed. Well, I would suggest uh, with respect, Kathy, that would be. Um, um, under, uh, hmm. yeah, hmm. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. I just don't know if this is, it's not an error or an omission, but it could okay. be. Okay, I just wanted to bring it forward. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. And uh, uh, once we've um, adopted the minutes, I will ask if there is any uh, business arising and that would be your, your question. Okay, thank Raise you. Raise your hand. Okay, so um, so uh, if there's no uh, uh, errors or, or omissions, I would ask for a motion to adopt the agenda. I see Ann Palmer waving her hand. Seconder, please. Oh no, no, Chair. I, I think I think Ann wants to speak to the. Uh, oh, minute. sorry. 
Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I just had, I uh, was looking for clarification. I either misunderstood or the mm -hmm. minutes are not correct. Um, I understood that Melissa had reported that there were 30 to 40 uh, meals served a day, but uh, the minutes say 30 to 40 people a day. And I'm wondering if there's clarification on that. Uh, is Melissa in the meeting? Yes, I've called in. Okay, so can you respond to that, please? Uh, that number is just the meals per day. I believe the number of people would be at least five less than that, as that kind of accounts for our delivery. Are you um, keeping track of, like, I mean, if somebody has three meals a day, are you considering that three people or one person, three meals? Or I was just curious as to um, how you were actually tracking numbers and people. Uh, yeah, I have a uh, drop in for the actual number of people. I have um, meals that are given in a day. Now, we don't necessarily really track seconds because Oftentimes we have deli sandwiches or other things. So if somebody needs an extra meal, we just kind of load them with a large meal and it is counted as a meal. So uh, for April, it was, it was about, I've got 33 meals per day. And uh, in terms of people, it's closer to about 28. Okay, and the other question that I was asked was, are you um, counting meals for staff and family members? Uh, yes, all of that would be included. If a staff has a meal, oftentimes we don't really have much time for it, um, and we just uh, nibble if anything. So, yeah, all the people and the meals are tracked in that. Okay, with respect, I think this is getting into business arising, um, not whether there are errors or, or omissions. So, um, uh, having said that, uh, if there are any other uh, errors or omissions from the minutes, I would ask for a resolution to adopt the uh, minutes as presented. Please, somebody. I'll move it, Mayor. I'll move it, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Moslin. Is there a seconder to that uh, motion, please? Uh, John Dehan. Uh, all those in favor? Mm. Opposed? Okay, I think what I'm going to do is what our mayor does, and I'm going to ask for anybody opposed to raise your hands. And then I can, uh, I can quickly go through and see who opposes. So that motion is carried. Now, business arising. And Kathy Hutton, you had a question with respect to the school district. Yes, I did. Uh, and it was uh, about the fact that younger children are not considered to be vectors of the disease, COVID. And uh, apparently that understanding has changed and I'm wondering if there is an update from the school district. Um, <clears throat> it's Anna Lotar here and uh, I wasn't at the meeting mm -hmm. with Miranda, so, but I did look at the minutes. And I think from our perspective and we of course are um, in contact, the ministry is in contact with the provincial health officer and, and their department. Um, where you have seen uh, children with COVID is in a place where there's community um, uh, spread. So uh, we've had daycares, for example, that are operating within BC that have not had these kind of clusters. So uh, our understanding is that it's really important. We've had a lot of trust in Dr. Henry uh, and how she has um, brought our province to the place where we are today. And we continue to have that trust in her. Um, and from their perspective, those children, like in BC's context, uh, the risk is very low. I don't know if that helps. Is that thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. moving on. Um, I'm going to ask for reports. And I'm just going to go down the agenda and speak to um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, people that are in attendance. So I'm going to ask uh, Sergeant Pepler if you're here. Is there anything to report from the RCMP? 
You know, I am here. Uh, any, is there anything specific you want to know from the RCMP perspective? Um, not myself. Are there any other members um, of the committee that would like to ask Sergeant Pepler a question? Uh, Chris Moslin. Yes. Th thanks, Chair. Yes, Sergeant, I, how, how has uh, the COVID pandemic impacted your services? Have, have, have you and your staff uh, uh, done any extra precautions in terms of personal equipment? Um, how, and I guess the other question is, has there been uh, any involvement by the RCMP in uh, some of the provincial orders about social distancing? Thank you. Okay, okay. yeah, no, um, as far as personal protective equipment, uh, between the fentanyl scare a few years ago and, uh, you know, wildfires and stuff, we've been outfitted with uh, half mask respirators, uh, N95 masks, um, hand sanitizer. So we are good there. Um, as far as operations go, it is business as normal. I mean, we have uh, reduced our front, we don't have a front counter, but people can call and uh, still meet with us if they need to come in, at, depending on what it is, they can. So we're still operating at full strength in that sense. Um, again, it's just now it's over the phone. You just don't get to come in and speak to a front counter person right away. Um, we are, a lot of communities are uh, all reporting different uh, results. I can say right now, and I don't want to jinx it, so I'm knocking on wood. Uh, we have seen a decrease in certain uh, crimes. Some of it, though, is attributed to a few of our clients being in custody right now, but also, too, there's less foot traffic out and about. So um, we are we, we have seen a decline, which is good. Um, and sorry, Councillor, uh, what was the third question in there? I, 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 we were looking, I was, I, my other question was, is, has the RCMP staff been involved in the enforcement of any provincial or uh, orders about social distancing? Uh, no, at this point, um, we have been told that they don't want us in an enforcement role just yet, but still an education role. Um, we are getting calls and uh, depending on the call, there is some follow up. Um, you know, however, a person reporting their neighbor having a backyard barbecue, well, that's not that's not something we're gonna, you know, kick in a door and uh, break up the barbecue. Um, however, we are educating people as best we can. But, you know, just in my observations with a lot of the people, the businesses, um, they're doing an exceptional job and uh, there hasn't been much cause for concern. Is there anything else from anyone? Thank you, uh, Sergeant Pepler. Um, next is, uh, is Tammy Battersby from the Blessings Boutique. Anything to report, Tammy? There we go. Hi. Um, no, nothing new. Uh, I just continue to help the helpers and work on food security measures. Okay, good. <clears throat> Amber uh, from the Boundary Country Regional Chamber of Commerce, anything from that you'd like to report from your perspective? Hello? Hey. Hello, are you there, Amber? I think I'm here. Okay. Um, so quite a few of the businesses will be opening on the 19th, which is the Tuesday following the May long weekend. And we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we've got a list of precautions that we need to take as businesses to make sure everybody's safe. Uh, we'll re be restricting numbers of people in the stores. Uh, most of us have already had our uh, shields installed and uh, we've got our sanitization stations. So we're excited. Good news. Um, Melissa, anything from the Whispers of Hope? Hi there, sorry, that was for Whispers. <laughs> yes, do you have anything to report from the Whispers of Hope? Um, pretty much the same. Our average meals per day does seem to be going up, whether that's just that the word is out or that demand is getting higher, hard to say right now. Um, and May is looking like 39 meals 
per day so far as opposed to the 33 in April. Um, really seeing a positive impact already that Ask Wellness has been having in their support services to people and just seeing people, you know, having a bit more opportunity to talk to people, get some help, uh, a little less anxiety. I know as the water rises, it's definitely affecting some people more than others. So having somebody there to help them troubleshoot those issues is nice. Um, still seeing the need for showers in the community, and I haven't seen any discussion around that. So I'm hoping we have a chance to chat about that today. But otherwise, business as usual for Whispers. Uh, Citizens for Better Grand Forks. I don't know who's going to report uh, if they have anything to say, John or, or Anne. John, you're unmuted, so. Now you're muted. No, John, you're okay. muted. Am I good now? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. I've, I've got the command backwards. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, um, we don't really have much to report. It's It's been a little bit... Um, Slow, I guess, is what I'm going to say. Um, we have heard from quite a few taxpayers with regard to some issues, which we will uh, talk about when we get to them on the new business. Um, there were several motions um, that were going to be tabled or, or brought to the table, so we will um, give you some feedback there. But our impression in general is is that you know the community is really um, preoccupied with all this COVID business and you know so I, th I, th I think people have a lot of their own worries right now and so we're you know to be uh, totally honest we're not getting as much feedback as we're accustomed to at the moment and so we're attributing it to COVID but nothing to report aside from that thank you thank you Tanis anything from coins uh, you're muted you are muted Yeah, no, Kate, do you have anything to report? Um, we have a meeting, um, a Zoom meeting on the 15th to talk with our elders board about um, starting to meet face to face with clients. We've just been meeting virtually and over the phone. Mm -hmm. So um, we're talking about uh, the possibility of meeting with clients face to face again, practicing social distancing and we'll know more about that on the 15th. Thank you. Uh, it, I don't see Zena at the meeting. Uh, is anybody here from Sunshine Valley Community Services? Okay. Sorry, Chair. Zena did uh, uh, send some regrets that she might not be able to make the meeting. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, anything from the regional district's uh, perspective? Um, Kathy here. Yes. I don't, I don't believe there is. I've asked Roly to report anything that he needs to report. He wasn't able to make the meeting today and he didn't tell me anything. So I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gary, anything from the Phoenix Foundation? Yeah, um, a couple of things I had mentioned last time that, uh, uh, we were looking at the neighborhood small grants and that MOU is coming through with Vancouver Foundation shortly. Uh, we allocated $3,000 for granting and they're matching it with seven. So that's going to give us a grant pool of 10, which includes, of course, some administrative costs. And then um, there will be an announcement on the federal level uh, coming, or sh coming uh, shortly. I am sworn to secrecy on that. So until you hear it from the government, um, I'm mum. But it's uh, it's going to be pretty cool. Oh, good. Something to look forward to. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Uh, I don't see Ian Taylor here. Is anyone else from the Senior Society here? Okay. Uh, Beth McCormick, team lead. Do you have anything to report uh, to this meeting? You're muted, Beth. There go. Okay, now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, for mental health and substance use services, I don't have anything specific new to report. Uh, it's kind of business as, well, business is unusual, I guess you'd say. 
Um, we are still doing our phone uh, sessions with clients and um, uh, yeah, psychiatry is the same, doing phone sessions with clients and we will be waiting for further direction from IH, who takes their direction from the province before we change anything that way. But um, our referrals are not up, uh, maybe a little bit down, uh, but yeah, so we're still serving the public, just different, uh, different ways of connecting at this point, but nothing new. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, then we're on to Teresa Taylor. Anything from Boundary Family Services to report? Nothing to report over here. Thanks, Christine. Okay, thank you. And Anna Lotard from School District 51. Is there anything you needed to add or wanted to add? Um, I think probably the one difference from the last meeting is that we have begun to offer in-school support to children who may need more individualized in-person support. Um, so it's dependent on which school kids are going to. They're not coming in for an extended period of time. It might be one or two hours. And it really is that personalized understanding of, you know, what they're unable to get from remote learning. So some teachers have small groups that are doing social games. Uh, others are going for walks with CYCs, having a little bit of time to talk about feelings. Uh, at the high school, I know we have some teachers uh, and child, kids going in uh, to like a shop class. So it's really individualized and just having that understanding that we do have some kids that this is not the best situation for them and we need to have that one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction. So that probably is the, the only change since Miranda was at the last meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Chair? Yes. Chair, I, I, I'm sorry, but can I, uh, I never got a chance to uh, direct a question to uh, uh, Teresa uh, about Boundary Family Support Services. Can I, can I interrupt uh, uh, and ask a couple questions right now? Certainly. Uh, yes, thanks, Teresa. For, ter Teresa, is there, a, I guess the question is, is there a formal report on the Stay Safe Shelter um uh being written and submitted to bc housing um as council is looking for uh some sp specific numbers on that shelter operation i know you reported during the winter quite faithfully i think it was like an average of eight to ten clients a night uh, till the end. I can't remember the exact number. But my question, Teresa, is there going to be a formal report submitted to BC Housing by Boundary Family Support Services? Thank I you. would say that's likely because that's the procedure for finalization of most contracts and services over the course of a, a fiscal year. Um, but I will have to leave that to Darren. So if you could just hold that question um until he's back around or shoot him an email okay you mean you're referring to darren yeah darren pratt that's right, right. Yeah. okay Th thanks Teresa. i have another difficult question for boundary family support services and you know please i i i'm with patient with the answer but let me ask the question is it still boundary family support services intention to uh be the operator for an extreme winter shelter in the winter ahead of us? I'm unable to comment on that at this point. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Okay, uh, John DeHaan had his hand raised. He needs to unmute himself. Thank you. Um, my question was for Anna Lotard. Um, hi, Anna. Um, Hey, with regard to uh, the gradual resumption of um, school activities, I'm pretty much in the loop, but one question I do have is with regard to um, PPE for um, teachers and educational assistants. Um, I, I haven't got anything really clear from uh, Norm Sabrin of the um, BDTA. Will the district be providing PPE upon request or uh, mandatory PPE for workers um, in the school? Um, so at this point, we're kind of waiting for 
um, some guidelines that are coming directly from the Ministry of Education and the provincial health officer. So I can't say with certainty what, um, what if those things will be given to employees. I do know that at this moment, uh, we are not using uh, like masks or um, gloves or things like that. And we do follow the provincial health guidelines when it comes to that. So we do all the other things. We do the physical distancing, we do the hygiene, hand washing, not touching our face. Um, we have custodians that are coming into our school throughout the day and they clean and disinfect high contact areas. Um, uh, so we're following the processes that are that have been put forth as the best practices um, and then we're waiting to see basically what will be coming forth probably by Friday uh, before we do some consultation with QP and BDTA uh, as we move forward. Okay, I appreciate the answer Anna, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm just going to have a quick look to see if there's anybody else that's got their hand raised and I don't see anybody. So moving on, um, uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Bob Hughes from Ask Wellness if you have anything that you want to uh, put out to this, uh, to this advisory group meeting and you are muted. Thank you, Chair, and uh, uh, hello to everybody. This is the first time I've been on the Zoom where um, we've had some video, so it's a pleasure to see some faces of, uh, of names and voices I've heard before. So I'm fortunate to have uh, with us is Barney Bennett is on the Zoom call as well, and he should be able to, if it's um, requested, to su summarize a bit of his activities. Um, I'll just reinforce um, uh, our role at this point um, in the community of Grand Forks uh, is to provide a COVID prevention outreach worker, um, that being Barney Bennett, and it's for the term of uh, uh, till June 30th, at which time um, I think it would be evaluated by, um, by stakeholders, uh, obviously the funder being BC Housing and our board of directors as to um, the role. Um, but our position has been to um, simply provide that uh, expertise in the field of outreach and um, working with, uh, with anchors, the, the City of Grand Forks, um, uh, BC Housing and Interior Health around having a, uh, um, a presence in the community to be able to assess individuals who may be um, experiencing the symptoms of, of COVID-19 and to be able to uh, have a, an effective response. So. Um, it's uh, Barney's been on the line and, and Barney's been in the role for just over two weeks and um, has uh, I think uh, been able to be quite effective in in reaching a diverse group of people in the community that need some support around personal hygiene reinforcement of the public health messaging around social distancing um, ensuring that people have access to food and if possible being able to deliver it to them uh, I think that's on the horizon so um, I appreciate the opportunity to join today's call and to um, be supporting the community in the way we are. And I'm open to any questions or um, uh, any, any, um, any inquiries, obviously, on the ground. Uh, um, Barney is with us today, too. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, perhaps then, Barney, if you would be good enough to give us a brief overview of your first two weeks on the job. Hi. Um, yeah, I've been just um meeting with everybody out in the public that may be vulnerable uh, mostly the homeless and the people that are struggling people living in campers or in or on the river banks or wherever um some are in motels some are just wandering around the streets and i've been just trying to provide hygiene supplies harm reduction supplies and camping supplies when I can do it. Um, you know, people are in dire straits around here, uh, especially the people on the riverbanks. They're going to be out soon, so you know, we're trying to support people. I, I go downtown to Whispers and spend an hour or so down there talking with people and just trying to give as much support as I can. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. Um, is there anyone here from Interior Health? Oh, or pardon me, not Interior Health, BC Housing. 
Chair, can I have a, a couple questions? Absolutely. For Mr. Bennett and Mr. Hughes. I, I, later on in the agenda and it is the uh, concept uh, of the vulnerable population shelter planning committee, which has met a couple times. Basically what it does is it has, it, it, it takes that population, divides it up into five streams, and then tries to find resources uh, for each one of those streams. Uh, so I guess my, my question to Mr. Hughes and to Mr. Bennett, or Barney and Bob, <laughs> is what can you share with us right now, what gaps you see in that strategy uh, for uh, the vulnerable uh, population? Thank you. I Thank see, you. A, I see a struggle uh, with people wanting to move from the areas that they're in already. Um, most people are, except for a select few, most people are comfortable where they are and it's going to be difficult to get them to move anywhere. Thank you, Councilor Moslin. Um, I, I think uh, many people on the call are aware, obviously, uh, the interior health representatives would be familiar with um, the uh, COVID response for vulnerable populations document that was done by the health authority along with BC Housing. Um, that uh, map that has been uh, our kind of guide in many of the communities, um, I think is applicable. Some of the areas or tiers that were defined in that document and that strategy um, are, are, are applicable to Grand Forks, others are not. Um, a number of them are related to re, uh, support to the shelter itself in communities for, uh, for those without homes. Um, another tier is around decanting or reducing the density in, in shelters. So with, without having a current shelter system in place, those are really not um, areas of focus. I think the, you know, as I say, our, the primary focus for us was around the provision of personal hygiene and sanitation options for people who are living and sleeping rough. And as we know, in many rural communities, there's people who are living in, in, in housing settings that are um, substandard and that they don't have access to fresh water, uh, to showers. So I think, um, you know, the first start was to be able to have hand washing um, options. And we, um, I understand that uh, there's some discussion that happened on a council level around um, the provision of water hand washing stations. and and BC Housing has requested we purchase two of these stations. We do have them, but um, my hope is in, on Friday when I'm uh, likely to meet with Councillor Moslin um, is to see where these may be best positioned for the community. I think it's um, important to have stakeholders such as the, the Chamber involved in, in that impact uh, in, in, in terms of the placement, if that's the case. I think Melissa's spoken about the need for showers and. And, uh, and that option. So I think that's something that that document speaks to around enhancing um, a people's opportunity for personal hygiene and cleanliness. Um, as to the uh, tier that is about uh, if somebody is COVID positive or is uh, showing some signs or symptoms of the, dis um, the virus, uh, there isn't currently a response in place that I'm aware of where people would be able to isolate and we've seen in some of the other communities that it's not just simply individuals that are, um, are without housing um, that can benefit from that. We have people who live in, in a higher density living arrangement in, in their homes that will require a, a place to isolate for the 14 days. So to that question, um, Councillor Moslin, I, do, I don't think we have at this place uh, any um, specific sites that have been uh, identified for uh, for individuals who would be either sick or um, uh, have been tested and awaiting the results and required to be isolated. So that remains, I think, a risk for the community in terms of where those folks would go in the event that we did uh, have a public health trigger such as this. Okay, and I would also uh, recommend, uh, Bob, that um, any meetings that you ha <clears throat> have with respect to, to that, uh, include our chief administrative officer, um, Duncan Redfern, because he would be the one that would give direction 
to um, to our employees if there was a location that was found suitable and could be could be. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I actually, Chair, um, uh, Maurice Watsky would be the right person. He's our interim operations manager. So um, Duncan, our CAO, would most likely refer it straight on to him just for information. Okay, well, um, we can go through those appropriate channels uh, in setting up the meeting. Um, I think it should go through uh, Duncan uh, and he can rec make recommendation to, to Morris if that's the direction that he wants to to go. Um, I see that uh, John DeHaan has his hand up and he's muted. Thank you. Uh, this, yeah, Bob, um, we've got a couple questions with regard to, like I'm familiar with the um, template that Interior Health put out. Um, given that, you know, we appear to be working towards uh, a, a tier one and tier two primarily on that and, and uh, given Barney's um, assignment. Um, one of those objectives would be at probably an education piece with regard to encouraging um, social distancing. And I know it's probably a very difficult task and easier to talk about than done. But I'm wondering whether you're Consider, or whether you've got any success stories for us with regard to attempts to, you know, get people to actually respect social distancing within the community and, you know, increase the perception for the community that, you know, this is happening and that, that we are moving to a place where everybody's very cognizant of, of maintaining their distance and those sorts of efforts. Could you please expand on, on what sorts of initiatives that we're taking at those levels to encourage that, please? Oh, I think Bob is muted. Sorry, my apologies. Um, so, uh, John, I think the, the best example I can give in terms of um, some of the a story that speaks to the, I think, the effectiveness and importance of that um, ability to respond in the community in an outreach level was almost immediately upon uh, Barney's hiring, and that was an individual that was um, parked, a, a woman parked in an RV right next to city council and uh, to, to city hall and the individual um, was uh, describing that they ha had been involved with public health and uh, had been awaiting some results for a test. She was from out of the community and, um, and didn't have access to showers or any kind of um, uh, fresh water, had plugged her vehicle into an adjacent building to await uh, um, the results. So what we were able to do was to secure um, for the short term for her to, to self-isolate at an RV park where she was able to, to shower, to have fresh water, and to um, basically be monitored and checked in on to, to see if she would be able to uh, adhere to the, you know, the recommendations of being self-isolated. So to your um, request about a story, I think that's a, that's a good example. As to just the overall um, messaging and, and education, it is very difficult for many people to follow the, the you know, identifying um, the, you know, dis social, safe social distancing. Um, I think it's one that we want to be able to monitor. I mean, obviously, from a public health perspective, being able to, to, to track and trace um, some of the activities that happen that are, are risk to the general population is important. And that's part of this role is, is it's education, but it's also being able to highlight areas that may be um, of, of significant risk. I think provincially, it's been a remarkable um, uh, status that we are in right now where we haven't heard significant um, outbreaks of, uh, uh, we've had risk um, uh, people at risk and needing to be tested, awaiting the results, but we haven't seen um, the homeless population and, and those in really acute poverty having um, uh, be uh, vectors of the transmission at this point. Um, I'm not an epidemiologist by any stretch, but I do um, know in our roles and in, in discussion with BC Housing across the province that we haven't seen a significant intake or a significant outbreak within this population that may, as you I think you're alluding to, have not been particularly um, 
uh, disciplined around social distancing and, 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 and that kind of um, uh, uh, follow through. So um, I think the intent is to be, have somebody on the ground in the event that we really do need to, 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 to pull somebody out of a, a setting where they are living communally and exchanging uh, of, uh, of, uh, of cooking equipment and facilities that we have the opportunity and a, and a response if that happens so that we could try to contain that response. Thank you, Brian. Okay. And, and my apologies, Chair, I, I have to leave for another call, but uh, Barney is in, in, you're in good hands with Barney representing us. So I thank you all and I look forward to, to connecting again. Well, thank you for, for your coming for the time that you were able to be with us. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Lee Big, did you have anything to add um, from Interior Health's perspective? Uh, no, nothing more than, than basically what Bev said um, as far as the MHSU part of things. Yeah, we're, we're enjoying a time with not a lot of, of issues from, on the COVID front, as, especially with the vulnerable population, like Bob was saying. So uh, yeah, not, not too much to add so far. So far, so good. Thank you. Um, Bud, do you have anything um, to let us uh, inform us about with uh, Governance Plus? You're muted. There you go. You're not muted now. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. I I don't have anything to add. I'm just here to answer questions if necessary. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Thank First you. meeting I've been in for years that I could actually have a cigarette. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Kara, I have some questions for Bud. Okay. And just a tip, Bud, if you turn the video off, you can really do anything. Uh, uh, I guess the, the question I have for you, Bud, is later on in the agenda, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, managing um, the vulnerable population. This is stream five, that is people who are camping outdoors. Uh, can have you can you tell has there been any recent is, incidents of concern uh, that you would like to tell the meeting about invol involving this population uh, encamped anywhere around the city? Has high water been an impact a safety concern? Or? In two cases, there's I am concerned about uh, their location of uh, riverside camps. Uh, other than that, no. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other organizations here to uh, <clears throat> excuse me to to ask reports from. So we'll move on. Um, uh, what I would like to know is the the a report on the vulnerable population shelter planning committee conference call. Councillor Mawson, you were a part of that. Can you speak to that? Uh, yes, yes, Chair, I can. Uh, and I, 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 there's another meeting coming up uh, later on this week, and um, I, I and I that was a call I made on May 5th, and uh, th it does speak to what Mr. Bob uh, was just speaking to a, a little a minute ago about what are the gaps in, in it. And um, if possible, uh, if I'm going to try sharing my screen really uh, briefly uh, with the meeting, just to show them this. Uh, so here goes, Chair, let's see what happens. Okay, so this is the minutes from that May 5th meeting, Chair, that I, uh, 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 participated in. You could see the five streams that we we're talking about, right? And uh, uh, being used as a grid uh, uh, for um, 
resources available. Uh, this has been presented to us by Matthew Cameron of BC Housing, who uh, is not at, unfortunately couldn't make this meeting, but who is involved in about 15 different communities around the province. Each um, community with, being unique, each with community. Moslin, um, for the benefit of those who are on phone only, can you um, review what Stream 5 is so that they don't know what we're talking about? Yes, Stream, stream 5. Uh, chair is basically for those who are choosing to stay outside. That is to live rough, um, uh, either in an RV or in a tent. Okay, uh, and you could see from this the, in Stream Five that there, you know, motocross is a big question mark. Uh, municipal park to open. Uh, the need for hand hygiene stations which uh, Barney is, tr is trying to, to fill. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that sort of thing. In other words, by showing you this, uh, the meeting this, I hope to indicate to you where the gaps are. Uh, stream four is a stream nobody wants to have anything to do with because that is for a mass of people who are infected with COVID. And uh, fortunately, uh, as Bob pointed out, there hasn't been a lot of that in this uh, 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 population, but you know, large spaces in Kamloops, Kelowna, and I believe Merritt have been uh, uh, reserved, you know, like in community halls, curling rinks, for this uh, uh, possibility. Anyhow, I, that that's basically the intent. Of, uh, of that group uh, chair is to fill in these gaps, to uh, answer these questions. And that is also the point of some of the uh, uh, motions that I'd, I'd like the meeting to give us some advice on in the next step. Uh, you know, what, what does the meeting uh, think would be appropriate? How should we fill this in? Uh, several of the uh, people in our meeting this afternoon we're also you know, on that phone call and are also part of the group. So I'm hoping we can uh, 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 go from there. And perhaps I, I call upon anybody else who was in that conference call, uh, if they would like to report about uh, their work uh, with this uh, uh, planning committee. Thanks, Jerry, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Anne, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, um, I'm just curious. Uh, this uh, is this the vulnerable population shelter planning committee that was discussed at our last meeting that there something was going to be put together, and if so, who sits on it? Thank you. Yes, the, the, I, I I don't know if we actually if the actual title is that community COVID response uh, is the group. Uh, many of the members, uh, I, I sit on it, uh, looking around, mem uh, there's um, uh, representatives from uh, Interior Health. Um, Can we get uh, names? Housing, of course. Um, uh, I believe uh, Tammy is there, as well as Melissa. Um, as these are, I think the intent is that it's people with, uh, who are on the front line. And uh, we're reporting back from that work uh, to this group as best we can. I'm sorry, I didn't catch all the names. So you had Tammy and Melissa and who from Interior Health? Uh, one, just, just, a, just one second, let me adjust my screen and I might be able to answer your question a, a, a little bit. Uh, as it is uh, one of those things. Lee, you're on that committee? I, I sit on that committee as well, yeah. Okay. And, and Chris Moslin, you're on it? Yes. Okay, and so we got Chris, Tammy, Melissa, Lee, and who else? Jeez, uh, sorry. I'm trying to find, uh, okay, so Anchors is also there. Who, who uh, would that be? Uh, and I'll, uh, Cheryl, I think it's Cheryl Good. Uh, although I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I don't know Cheryl's last name. 
Uh, we have a representation from the Homelessness Specialist Association, so, uh, Homelessness Services Association of BC, uh, a lady by the name of Chloe Good. Uh, you'll recall that it was that association that help, was helping us lead the point in time count that never happened. Mm -hmm. uh, Amanda Erickson is on uh, from the uh, community action teams uh, is on that is in that meeting. Um, I think I actually see the fire chief on that meeting as well. Um, I think that was a suggestion from the last meeting to invite him to the next one. Yes, I, and I, I so I I think I got it. Tannis is there as well as uh, uh, a, a new lady working with coins. Uh, is also there, Tanya, I believe. Uh, so I hope I've answered your question, probably not as briefly as the chair would like. Sorry. Um, so are you going to be sharing these minutes with the Grand Forks uh, Social Services Advisory Group? Uh, as, as, as much as I can, I certainly am. Uh, that is my intent. That's Have why you I not get copies? I, I've, you know, I, I, it's not my meeting. I will have to ask the, uh, 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 the chair of those meetings if that if that be appropriate, and okay. uh, I'm hoping it will be, uh, because you know we sort of need to stay get in this all together. Okay, the um, the minutes from last uh, meeting specifically say that the plant this vulnerable population shelter planning committee will be made up of members from the Grand Forks SSAG and the larger community. I don't see anybody from the community on it. Well, except the, except the people who are on who are there. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, that's I, all kind of to do with just strictly social services. It's not actually any representation of the community. Uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, there's so much overlap. There's this. There's this group. There's also the Grand Forest Community Action Team, uh, which even had um, the fellow from Juice FM there last time. Uh, the in and the, as these meeting that this particular meeting does not happen with Zoom, it happens through web. It's mostly done by phone. So you know it, that that is is difficult to say record it and to share it. Okay, uh, but certainly if you're communicating to a you know council member of council, then you you have to assume that most of what you're doing is public. Uh, and uh, okay, thank you. Is he part of that group? Is Sergeant Pepler a part of that group? No, no he's not. Not that I no, I haven't seen his name on the invitee list. Okay, uh, no, I'm no longer a part of that group. Sorry, okay, thank you. Is um, it, Chair, is there anybody here from BC Housing who can? Uh, I was asking for that and I didn't see anybody's. On the on the list uh, of of invitees that was here from BC Housing, yeah. Um, Kathy Hutton, were you wanting to say something? I keep seeing a little your. Okay. Um, Kathy here. Yes. I don't think so. No, I don't. Okay, need I to just say anything. I see your name highlighted, and so I just wondered. I didn't. Not trying to ignore you, but because you're on the phone, I don't necessarily know if you're if you're wanting to yeah. ask. Okay, no problem. Okay. All right. Does that uh, that deals with uh, that report, uh, Councillor Mosn? I'm going to ask you to report on council decisions May 11th. I'll try, but yeah, I, I think if Mr. Drexler is still there, he certainly might uh, be able to chime in too. Uh, I, you know, I, <laughs> I don't, we don't get our minutes till the public sees their minutes, so I have a hard time. All I have to rely on is my memory, which is good, it's just short. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the motions was to seek advice from this committee. Uh, uh, which is, if you, if you did watch the council meeting, uh, that, so that's certainly the intent of what we're, we're about, is to br bring council questions, concerns, uh, to, to seek advice from this committee, understanding that, you know, you're all only two days into, from getting the agenda, that you're, you know, we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear discussion 
I don't think we're, my expectation is not to get coherent, unified advice. Uh, uh, although I have put motions before the meeting, mostly to trigger discussion and to trigger conversations between the members of this committee so that we can hear uh, as, as many perspectives as we can. Um, so there was that motion. Uh, there was also the mo two motions having to do uh, one with a seeking uh, to place hygiene stations uh, uh, beside the uh, porta potties. Uh, that was uh, 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 the second motion. And um, I'm trying to remember the third motion. Is Mr. Uh, Drexler's yeah, yeah the, the other one was regarding identification of the hotel rooms and commercial RV sites for isolation purposes, I believe, Councillor. Right. And uh, Council, uh, uh, you know, basically did not want to tie the staff up uh, going around uh, checking with motels, it sort of, uh, you know, was in support of finding those resources, but not necessarily providing them. Uh, that it, they saw that as the task of uh, BC Housing and Ask Wellness uh, to uh, come up with those resources. Did I summarize that correctly, Chair? Do you think I got that? I think you did, yep. So those are the, uh, the motions, uh, uh, three motions that went, that I think were uh, uh, appropriate to this meeting that came out of council on May 11th. Unless I have skipped anything, did I miss anything, Mr. Dressler? Um, no, I think that that was the gist. Um, I, I believe uh, Councillor Zielinski had originally a request too, but there was never a council motion, I think, regarding that. Yeah, the, the, the question, you know, but that's behind council, you know, is one of the ones I did ask uh, 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 Teresa earlier, you know, is we in, in, in the COVID epidem epidemic and in managing it, we do not want to lose resources that we thought we already had uh, obtained. That is, we're concerned about an extreme weather shelter uh, and not wanting to get caught sideways, uh, you know, late in next year and having to find a provider as well as the location. Um, that was a real uh, uh, concern of councils and getting back uh, from that and, uh, you know, making sure that uh, the, that arrangement is still going forward uh, and checking with uh, in more depth with uh, Boundary Family Support Services. Okay, Lee, I see you have your hand up. Hi, Council Mosin. Uh, I was just curious if there was any discussion, and maybe it's already happened, I don't know, but around opening some, some of the public bathrooms as sanitation stations and things like that. I, I just know that was talked about before, and I don't know if it was brought up with Council. Yeah, it, it, it certainly was, uh, Ali. We, we, we talked that about, and basically what, we're, what we're, we're thinking is we really would like to fill spaces at private RV parks as much as possible, that we are waiting for guidelines from the province on how we should reopen uh, our own public washrooms. That is, what level of service would be necessary uh, uh, for us, for the city, to uh, uh, abide by uh, the provincial guidelines on those openings. And uh, John, I see you have your hand raised as well. And you're muted, John. You're muted. There you go. Um, sorry, um, just very quickly, um, I was wondering, uh, Christine, whether it might be time i would like to make a motion to move on to new business we've got three motions to discuss um and uh i don't want to rush anyone but uh it looks like we've got less than an hour left to wade through that i think they're very important discussions coming up uh, yes i i agree unless there's anybody here that had uh something else that they wanted to report on or ask a question about and I'm not seeing any uh, raised hands, so we are going to move on. Thank you. Uh, so under new business, there are some proposed re uh, resolutions from the um, to the group. 
Uh, and uh, I would ask Councillor Moslin to speak to those. Yes, your, uh, yes, Chair. Basically, th this is my attempt to try to uh, capture the information or generate discussion that uh, uh, Council was looking to hear uh, about these issues. Okay. Um, you know, I, I guess basically the, it, where do the, tr the challenge for Council say, Council hears a whole bunch of complaints about Modo, wants us to clear out Modo. Okay, yeah, well, there's some problems legally with that. There's a there's the barrier. Uh, you know, you have to have a place to put them, and then even then, if you have a designated uh, area for them, it, it might still be difficult to move them. Okay, but the the back the, the underlying idea is. Is she, are we happy with the situation as is? That is, we have random camps around town of different populations, different personalities. Would it be better to have a designated area? So that's the intent behind that resolution is to generate discussion of this from this group. If you want to table, defer, postpone the, that motion, uh, if we get a seconder, uh, I, I'm fine with that. I, ju I just would like to hear the committee and then the different perspectives of the people on the committee uh, discussing, is, is it better, the, you know, do we strive to find a designated area for the vulnerable population just during the COVID epidemic or should we leave it as is? Anyhow, that, so that's, I, 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 I seek your direction, Chair. Is it enough just to put that discussion on there and uh, ask for the table to discuss that rather than putting a motion on the floor? Or how would the committee like to deal with it? Uh, I don't have an issue with uh, hearing people's comments prior to making a resolution. Um, it, uh, it, it would... Uh, perhaps after discussion, formulate an appropriate resolution or just suggest that the matter be dropped. So I will open it up for discussion. And Anne, I see you have your hand raised, followed by John. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was wondering if perhaps we could get Mr. Barney Bennett to um, speak to this because he did mention earlier that um, all the people that he's dealing with don't want to move anyhow. Barney, would you comment? Thank you. Yes, um, some would be into moving, I'm sure, but there's the ones that are nestled into their home spaces that I believe are going to be difficult to get them out of there. Um, they they like their space where they are, and um, it's going to be you'd have to offer them something pretty pretty nice to get out of this some of the situations that some people are in. Okay, can I add to that? Yes. I, I just a, a question to follow up with it, if I could. Um, so, when you say some of them, do you do you have numbers? Do you have a feeling for how many would be willing to move into um, other areas, and how many would actually rather prefer to be where they are? I'd have to go and ask them personally. I'm up there every usually twice a day on the weekdays. So, if you like, I can go up and and converse with people and find out what they they feel like. Awesome. If we never ask them, how will we know? That's right. Okay, thank you. Uh, John? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, Chris Moslin, um, this is for you. Um, look, we're, we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place here with Mono. Um, as you know, there's been ongoing concern about, uh, in particular, fire issues. We've got the um, Rattlesnake Mountain owners group now formally registered, um, largely, I think, out of concern uh, for the um, uh, fire danger that is present there. Um, there's a lot of people that have asked the city for answers with regard to who's prepared to assume liability. In fact, at the March council meeting, the CAO was tasked with going away to um, and, and coming back to council with an answer with regard to the city's 
uh, position on liability. Uh, what we got from him was more of an explanation of what couldn't be done. We didn't really get a straight answer with regard to liability. Uh, what we did hear was in reference to the Abbotsford ruling, which probably most people at this table are aware of, it was a precedent set whereby they cited section uh, uh, seven rights in the charter and um, therefore um, a city, it is incumbent upon a municipality to provide something. And the rationale behind that was that municipalities could not enforce um, bylaws uh, governing public or usage of public space without providing that alternate. Now, Moto has never become the official alternate because we have not had a formal declaration by the city um, declaring that it is. We seem to be in this, I'm trying to be diplomatic here, we're in this, this kind of gray zone where nobody's admitting that it's real, but yet it's there. So, I, I, you know, I, I can support the idea of a designated area, but the question becomes where? Um, that, and that's going to be really important in terms of community perception. Where would we do this? And of course, what would it look like, which I see is on the agenda today. We're hearing also that people from Barney, and, and I, I think we all knew this, that people are going to be reluctant to move away from there, some people. And we know that the legal reality is, the challenge is, is that in order to force people out, that it will take a court injunction to do that. And we would have to formally request an injunction and go through all that, which could take two years. Um, given that, we need to have, Chris, a commitment from the city one way or another to do something here and to articulate the end game. Like, is the end game going to be to get all these people in one place? If it is, where? That's my question. And I think, you know, that's the million dollar question and it has been for a long, long time. That's the one we need to get past. Thank you. John, that's exactly what we're about here. I'm asking you. <laughs> Can I just turn it right back to you? I, I understand the, the frustration with the, the clarity or lack of it uh, in, in the staff report about liability. Nonetheless, the, the question is, would you in your uh, participation and engagement with the community would you? I don't even want to talk about specific spots, but would you? Uh, would you be uh, uh, supportive of the idea of a of a spot? For me, I really, I, I, I don't think the city's going to support anything that doesn't have services. Sorry, we, we, we were just, just shudder about you know that uh, you know putting somebody out in the middle of nowhere with no services just becomes problematic. Nonetheless, the challenge is. Is it, do we maintain the status quo or do we try to create and develop a designated area? So my question to you, John, is should we? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I, I, I can respond to that. Chris, I've, I've lobbied for probably close to three years for the city to provide a designated area. Um, that area would have I think a uh, uh, physical and, and, and um, manpower requirements that are important. Um, those would be, uh, I've articulated those in the past. And in fact, I did have a, an online discussion uh, with Brian Taylor after the, I believe it was the March council meeting, um, talking about some concerns about Moto and about what it might look like down the line to do something uh, uh, formally and, and, and acknowledge it. Um, we all know this is gonna be, this is gonna come at a cost to the city. Maybe BC Housing is in the mood to kick in the money. I, I don't know. But you know, I, I, I can guarantee you, you're gonna get a taxpayer reaction if this thing costs any money at all. 
um, and I, I don't anticipate that it would be a positive one. Um, given that, I think, you know, I, like in, in my, from my own perspective, I am supportive of something organized where we know what it's about. But I think so critical in this discussion is going to be location. We, you know, we need to give taxpayers a sense that the impact to neighborhoods is going to be minimal. Um, you know, oddly, I think in, in a way taxpayers are somewhat supportive of the moto location because it's out of sight, out of mind. I talked to the mayor about a six point, I, I actually submitted it to him, a six point fire mitigation strategy for moto things that could be done to mitigate. But, you know, the, the feeling I got, that was to be forwarded to the CAO. I didn't hear back from the CAO. But, you know, to be honest about it, what I'm getting the sense of here is that the minute we start doing things to say, make moto safe, put up a fence, but, uh, do a controlled burn, create a fire break, uh, remove uh, organics, whatever, We've got the city in a situation where they're now admitting that they're taking responsibility for it. We need somebody to take responsibility for it. So in short, I don't want to burn up everyone's time. Yes, we would support a well-organized, articulated effort to deal with this once and for all. And I think conditional on that would be the eventual dismantling of MOTO. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, Anne, I see you have your hand up. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just curious as to whether or not anybody has actually spoken with the uh, group from um, Valley Heights in regards to Moto. I, 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 Anne, Jan, I, not to any uh, organized group. I have spoken to landowners or people who, who live up there. Uh, at Valley Heights. I, I've just been hearing through social media and through friends that um, they're not very happy with the possibility of fire and and other things and so and uh, the last I'd heard was that nobody had really talked to them from the City Hall about their concerns so I was just curious as to whether that had been done or was likely to be done. Well I would suggest um, that if there is a group or an association or whatever did they get together, uh, put their concerns in writing and submit them? Um, not all of us uh, are on Facebook all of the time. And frankly, I don't respond to Facebook posts very often. Um, but th that is when it would come to council and that it could be, um, it could be dealt with. Uh, but um, we need to have something before us uh, to um, to uh, to review and comment on. So that's that would be my suggestion. Now, uh, anybody else want to comment? Tammy has her hand up. Okay. Tammy. Thank you, Christine. Um, I just wanted to ask a question for clarification. Uh, this resolution is to do with um, a response during COVID or a response to homelessness. I had understood that this resolution was a response for those that are homeless during the COVID. Uh, and just clarification on that would be appreciated. Okay, there are three proposed uh, resolutions and you're quite right. The first one does deal with uh, dealing with the vulnerable population during COVID-19. I think we've kind of discussed some of the other ones as well um, in, in generality. So if, if there is anyone that would like to forward the first resolution or amend the wording, and that is that the City of Grand Forks together with provincial partners and community groups, strive to find a designated area for the vulnerable population during the COVID-19 emergency. Is there some, someone with their hand raised to make that resolution or to amend it? Or 
Does it just want to get dropped? Not uh, seeing anybody raise their hands, so Councillor Moslin and John DeHaan next. Oh, okay. I, I remember my, my intent, uh, Chair, was just to hear the discussion, and it has been pretty good. I, I certainly hear pros and cons, uh, you know, uh, I, and I also hear for Tammy's need for clarification, and believe me, that's, that's our, our clarification that we're seeking too, in our own minds, Tammy. You know, Mr. John talked about the end game, you know, that's one thing about COVID, it, it, it might be bringing us closer to the end game. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, the, the motion is, is basically a designated area for the, during, for the vulnerable population during COVID. Uh, so I, I've certainly heard pros and cons. It'd be difficult to move people. Uh, some people would be willing to move. There is no defined uh, designated area, um, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So, but the discussion's been good. But I, I, you know, the the intent is to keep our eye on the prize, uh, to come up with something that's maybe unique to our community, th that is going to last uh, uh, past this uh, pandemic. Anyhow, thank you. I'll turn it back over to the table chair. Thank you, John. You had something you wanted to say. I think I'll withdraw my question. I think Chris answered it. Thank you. Okay. Um, the reason I'm asking for a resolution is because that is part of the new business, that the Grand Fork Social Services Advisory Group make the following recommendations. And the first one was dealing with the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, so is there anybody that wants to bring that resolution forward or reword it? Could you read okay. it, please, Chris? Yeah, um, the, the Grand Fork Social Services Advisory Group make the following recommendation, that the City of Grand Forks, together with provincial partners and community groups, strive to find a designated area for the vulnerable population during the COVID-19 emergency. And Tammy, did I see that you raised your hand to move that? You did, and I wondered if, um, if it, if it needs to be the city that's finding something or the city that's endorsing something being found. So I'm thinking in terms of um, if an individual is presenting with symptoms and needs to be isolated away from the rest of the population um, and a hotel room needs to be purchased on their behalf to, to accomplish that, um, is, it, is it the city that has to find that hotel room or can the city just endorse that a group who's looking after the needs, the frontline needs of these individuals um, is able to do that with the city's blessing. So that, that would be one individual, that wouldn't be the whole populace. But, but if it's a response to COVID, what we're looking at is how do we respond to the isolation needs of that population for this time? And, and um, that resolution makes it the city's responsibility to respond and, and then ties the hands of the social service sector um, until you've, you've done that. And I'm thinking that um, city council as representatives of our community um, probably have enough on their plate. They don't have to be out finding these places, but they do, they do have to be endorsing the ones that are found. So that would be my suggestion for an amendment, but I would appreciate discussion on that first. Okay, um, Anne, and then Amber, and then John. So Anne. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, last meeting, BCH uh, was um, Michael Cameron, was that his name, or Matthew Cameron or something? And he had said that uh, he was going to look into, um, Christine, you had suggested um, broad acres. It was suggested that perhaps an RV site that had um, shower facilities, tenting facilities, as well as motel facilities. Uh, it sounded like BCH were the ones that were actually going to go looking for a place for this problem. Um, what happened to them? We ha I haven't heard back. I don't know if that was discussed at their at the meeting that Councilor Mosin attended uh, or not? It, it appears to me uh, from what Mr. Hughes said uh, earlier this afternoon 
uh, motel rooms still have not been obtained. Uh, and incidentally, I, I certainly uh, uh, echo uh, Tammy's. Uh, <laughs> I didn't catch that. Re Please say that again. <laughs> Tammy's wording uh, uh, about the motion, and that was certainly one of the concerns from council. So, uh, and uh, maybe we we should put that this the city of Grand Forks endorse the work of its provincial partners and community groups as they strive to find in designated areas for the vulnerable population during the COVID-19 emergency? Is, well, with respect, I don't think council can endorse something until they've seen it. So, anyway, that... Okay, okay. Uh, that was just my attempt, uh, uh, Chair, uh, 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 a uh, amendment. The yeah. chair is, I'm, I'm also watching, the, I, I can move the motion and then we can discuss amendments. Chair, do you want to do it that way? That's and, fine with me. Or, hey, I see Ms. McCormick has got her hand up. So did um, Amber and she would be before. I don't see Bev McCormick's hand up, but I do see Amber's. Hi, I just needed a bit of clarification. I had to step away for a moment. When you read out the, um, um, the resolution said for the vulnerable population. Um, were we discussing um, like for vulnerable, is this anyone that's in need of a place to isolate away from their family? Or are we talking about homeless specific? Or I, I, I must have missed the first part of the conversation. So the vulnerable population being homeless or the vulnerable population being people who are in a situation where they're going to uh, or potentially could expose their uh, family members to the virus, seniors, um, parents, whatever it happens to be. Councillor Malson, do you want to? My understanding is that from listening to Mr. Hughes earlier this afternoon, is that it is both. Uh, like for some streams, uh, if you had somebody who was in a high density family situation, they, they too would need uh, to be able to self isolate in a motel room. Uh, perhaps it's even a healthcare worker trying to stay away from their family. Uh, uh, but the, but the, the expression vulnerable population seems to almost be synonymous with the homeless, but that's not always the case. I hope I, try, I tried well, to clarify if, that. If we're referring to the COVID virus, um, what comes to my mind is more seniors are vulnerable than that, that's my first thought of vulnerable population. So that's why I wanted some clarification. Uh, yeah, they're certainly vulnerable, but many of them are in, uh, uh, you know, other than maybe single seniors, many of our most vulnerable seniors are in uh, care homes uh, uh, of some sort. Anyhow, uh, Chair, if uh, I should, uh, how about if I move it? Oh, I see Mr. DeHaan is waving his hand. Yes. Yeah, he's got ahead. a suggestion how we can move forward. John? Um, yeah, Chris, that's where, where I was going to go too. I think we can move forward with um, uh, just an amendment to the motion, uh, which speaks, which um, uses the word support instead of endorse, and that the City of Grand Forks support efforts um, by, uh, um, I forget how it was worded, by the provincial partners, et cetera, um, specific to the COVID emergency. I think um, community support would be pretty much guaranteed there. It's an extenuating circumstance and it's one that uh, looks book-ended to me. So anyways, uh, it doesn't, it, I think we do, it's very important that we look at this as being a separate initiative from solving our overall problem in Grand Forks, if you want to term a problem. Um, th that said, um, specific to the COVID emergency that the City of Grand Forks support efforts by our partners to find a designated um, location. Okay, that's your... If John will move that, I'll second that, Chair. Mm -hmm. I'm prepared to move on it. 
So John makes the motion, Councillor Moslin seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? And if you're on the phone and want to comment, please chime in. Okay, not seeing or hearing anything. I'm going to ask all those, all those opposed, raise your hands. The motion is passed. Okay, the second uh, uh, resolution would be that the Grand Fork Social Services Advisory Group make the following recommendation. That the City of Grand Forks, together with provincial partners and community groups, find a suitable location for supportive housing. And I would suggest rather than find, that the, the word find, recommend, be inserted there instead of a suitable location. Okay. Would you like to, uh, John? Sorry. Um, yeah, with regard to that, I, I'd like to uh, uh, ask, we had an inquiry actually uh, from a member of the community about um, progress on the current efforts to secure the Legion property and the whole land swap deal with Second Street. Like what's happening there firstly? I understand really nothing is, is happening um, with that at this time. D does that mean, sorry, Christine, if, uh, if I can follow up, does that mean that it's off the table or that no one's made a decision? I would suggest no one's made a uh, decision and Councillor Mosen, you can correct me if I'm misspeaking here. No, uh, you know, you're quite right. Uh, the intent of this motion is, ba is basically is to get us in the conversation. Uh, uh, you know, I, we don't, nobody likes surprises. Uh, uh, worst of all, counselors. Uh, however, uh, you know the the bottom. The other concept is: is do we do we, as this committee, does this committee support the idea of supportive housing in our community? I, I do like uh, uh, Councillor Thompson's uh, suggestion. The chairs that uh, that we recommend a suitable location. Uh, uh, our locations uh, f for supportive housing, that we be on, the, the, the work of this committee would be to make those recommendations, uh, you know, uh, with, you know, together with its partners in order to find it. But the bottom line is, is do we, are we for the concept of supportive housing uh, in, in our community? Uh, so I'll, I'll pass it back to uh, the, the committee for discussion. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Anne, you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, can I just get clarification on this? Are we looking at, um, is this for the, the winter extreme winter shelter? Because I'm assuming that as the, um, the Greyhound bus station is up for sale and could very well be sold, that you're looking for a new place. So this is for a winter shelter? Is this what we're talking about? My interpretation of supportive housing uh, would be uh, just that, not, not specifically um, a shelter, uh, cold or extreme weather shelter. Okay, so um, we can build something that small because according to um, Mr. Bennett, he was saying that uh, most people don't want to leave where they are. And they only had nine people running into the shelter um, through the winter utilizing it. So I'm, I'm or what are we looking at here, I guess is what I'm asking when you're talking about supportive housing. Because when it first came up on Second Street, it was started at it being uh, 54 or more apartments and, and which we do not have a need for and um, finally ended up being nothing for the time being. So I, I would really like to know what do you define supportive housing as? How many? Uh, what, what, what's our need? <clears throat> well, I would suggest um, that that would be for, for discussion with with uh, with the provincial partners and the and uh, community groups, uh, what they view uh, is the requirement. Um, yes, the one that was proposed was not only for um, those with addictions and uh, mental health issues, but it was also for seniors. 
uh, also to uh, to be housed and uh, so there was there was more to it than than just those with mental health and addictions so um, but this is certainly something that could be um, be looked at uh, and discussed and uh, recommendations coming back um, and this is only just um, uh, for discussion purposes with the, with those groups. That would be my interpretation. And then Dr. Laverty is going to call me. Sorry. Sorry, Kathy, did you say something? Or Tannis? I said something. This is Kathy. Yes. And I thought you. I was on mute. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try that again. Um, John, you had your hand up. Yeah, Chris, what I'd like to do is maybe suggest an amendment to your proposed motion Please do. Um, before we put it on the table, if we do, and that would be to back up a step and instead of um, looking at locations that this committee uh, identify and define the need, um, I, I think maybe I'd like to get Tammy's input on this as well. Because we and Chris, to you too. Uh, we were, you know, we were in the middle of getting a a, a point in time count organized, yeah. and I think what kind of guided community perception so much was that there was a real disagreement over what the need actually was. Like Anne pointed out, we started out with fifty units, I think fifty two or whatever it was, and then it got modified it ended up being 34 and then there was the zoning issues and you know public uh, uh, outcry etc cetera, etc cetera. and it ended up being tabled now it appears to be back on the table with the legion we don't know physically what this new proposal looks like the community if, if, if you expect any support they're gonna need details so what my suggestion here is is for this committee to provide the details and then to discuss things like location. So can you give us the wording of the resolution then, John, as you, uh, as you see it? Um, sorry, I'm gonna have to ask you to read the original uh, motion. Okay, so that the, uh, I'm not gonna read the preamble. That the city of Grand Forks together with provincial partners and community groups recommend a suitable location for supportive housing. Okay, instead of recommend a suitable location, I would say identify and define the need and feel free to suggest amendments. But I think you understand the spirit of what I'm saying. John, I think what you're trying to say is that the Grand Fork Social Services Advisory Group will do the action together with provincial partners and community groups uh, recommend uh, uh, and I missed them I'm sorry I'm still trying to well I'm trying to get away from location at this point Chris until we for example complete a point in time count identify exactly what we need and what it's going to look like absolutely yeah you know I it, it's so but we were really close to getting that point in time count out the door and it would have been really helpful. And uh, a lot of good things came to an end in March uh, prematurely. Uh, I know I certainly, I, 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 I like your uh, suggestion, John. I really, I would like to see it be the work of this committee to identify the need uh, and propose models. You know, uh, you know, and perhaps this committee can break itself into a subcommittee uh, to do that work. Uh, my the intent is to have let's have community a community conversation and take that conversation forward rather than you know having suddenly get a surprise from coming down on us okay and with respect to everybody um, it's uh, six minutes to three so if if somebody wants to make that resolution as identified or suggested by John and seconded uh, I'd ask for a mover and a seconder, please. Before we go there, Chair, um, the Coins has had their hand up several times. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Tannis. I... 
don't have everybody. Hi. Can you can you hear me? Yep. I just um wanted everybody to recognize that um the people up Moto, it's not that they don't want to go anywhere and that they wouldn't want to be in support of housing. It's that they don't want to go anywhere if that means they got to pack up their campers and trailers and move to another location where they have the same as what they have now, which is no toilets, no washing station. They certainly would be willing to move if they had supportive housing. If they had something better to go to, they would be willing to move. So I just, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. So not to uh, discount those numbers. Okay, anybody else have any comments? Tammy. I also wanted to, to share just for the education of anybody that needs it. Um, supportive housing is, is not only set aside for those who are without housing. It is set aside for, for those who are precariously housed as well. And this is where we see our need. Uh, we still have flood families in RVs. We still have singles from the flood in RVs. We still have um, people couch surfing. And, and those numbers would not have been captured by a point in time count. So along with the population that is, that is living without housing completely, there are all these other numbers. Uh, and supportive housing includes full-time workers and programs. And um, I believe Teresa Taylor had spoke to that at, at one meeting and if she was willing to speak to it again, there was information available on the BC Housing website on what supportive housing is um, and it's very detailed. So I recommend that you, that you visit the BC Housing website, see what supportive housing is, see what it offers, um, educate yourself um, so that you can come at it with a knowledge of what would be provided and then that would help you understand better where. That's all. Thank you. Um, John, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I, I think what I'm gonna do considering the timeline here um, is I'm gonna suggest that you know with everybody's agreement that we table this thing for now and that we table it with the intent of coming back to it and um, that we move forward in the spirit of this committee committing down the line to defining and identifying the need um, I, i'm not saying there is no need that's not my intent here but I, I do need something concrete to take back to the community. And I, I agree with Chris. Um, he, he was talking about opening up a community conversation about it. I think uh, his, his uh, comment that we shouldn't be dropping bombshells here, that we, you know, this should become as close to a carefully articulated community conversation as possible. I think is the prudent thing to do. So I'm suggesting that this committee continue this discussion, continue this work in the spirit of defining what we need for the sake of clarity and for the sake of uh, uh, public uh, um, presentation. Thank you. So are you making a motion to table these last two items to our next? Uh, we could either withdraw the motion or we could, we could well, we, we haven't had a motion, so we, we like, we, we don't need to withdraw anything. We, we can just commit uh, informally. It'll be on the record as far as our minutes go to uh, table this and, and come back to it next meeting. Sure. Okay. I'll do you that. I'll, I'll just write the meeting agreed to table it uh, for a future meeting. Yeah, both of the unfinished items under new business. Thank you. Because there's, there's the two. Okay, there were no late items. Um, Next steps, anybody got any call? Oh, Anne, sorry, you have your hand up. <laughs> so 
sorry. I, I do have a question. Um, is BCH so um, set on the model that they tend to promote that they are not willing to consider other alternatives for smaller communities? I, I still think every time I've heard uh, John talk to, uh, about his concept of, of something that could be perhaps at the base of Moto um, that has all these different facilities and, and would be an ideal thing. Um, and it, BCH seems to have unlimited amounts of money. They're always spending it. Um, why are they just not willing to, to work with smaller communities to give us what we really need? That's a question we would have to pose to them. I, I don't have an answer. Okay, did you have something else, Anne? Your hand is still up. Okay. Uh, okay, so no next uh, steps. Uh, next meeting, there's a proposal that we meet next um, June 17th at 1.15. Uh, venue to be determined. John? Um, I, I, I just want to seek a little bit of clarification on one thing um, before we agree to a meeting date. Uh, I want to ask Chris, uh, and, and Chris and Chris, um, with regard to what we did, uh, the motion we did make today, that will be going back to council. I do have uh, um, a bit of concern that we are adequately addressing the COVID issue. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think community perception set aside, I think it's important that we do what we can to mitigate um, with regard to the impact of COVID on this population. Um, Chris, and Chris, do you feel satisfied with what you're taking back to council and do we need to revisit that particular subject? perhaps earlier. I'm, I, you know, um, I'm, I'm great with the June 17th meeting, but I'm just wondering whether what you're going back to council with, uh, considering council schedule, et cetera, kind of fills the need there because the COVID thing, I do view it as uh, emergent. So given that. Well, I don't disagree with you at all. It is emergent. And what we are doing is following the recommendations from Dr. Henry. Um, and uh, uh, su supporting her decisions. And we haven't discussed yet uh, uh, in total what, what we're going to be doing uh, for our staff uh, at City Hall or our future council meetings. That will be determined uh, in accordance with the recommendations of Dr. Henry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but- that your question? Yeah, well, not not really. What, what my question was more specific to with is is to what we um, uh, uh, carried at the meeting today, the the uh, resolution moving forward, which my impression was was that both you guys would be taking that back to council, and okay. that would be a recommendation that went to council. Um, I'm asking you whether you feel that it adequately addresses the urgent or the urgency of the um, situation with COVID. And if that then, if, if we can feel comfortable with a clear conscience, so to speak, to meet as late as June 17th. Um, in my opinion, we will take this back to council. Uh, if for some reason, um, uh, people watching the council meeting are not happy with the decision, uh, they could certainly uh, approach Darren Pratt and request that he call a special meeting prior to June the 17th. Okay, I think that's a good strategy. I just wanted to make sure we were um, we were doing the right thing here with, with having a meeting so far away. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, anybody else have any comments? And I'll go down so I don't miss anybody. They've got their hand up. No, I don't think so. So uh, the next meeting then at this time, June 17th at 1.15, venue to be determined. Uh, anybody have issue with that? Raise your hand, Anne. 
Not an issue, but I would certainly um, prefer, I don't think that things are going to have changed by June 17th. I think Zoom seems to be the safest way to have meetings like this. So I would just like to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing none, then I would ask for a resolution to adjourn this meeting. So moved. Okay, all those in favor? Hey. Meeting is adjourned. Hey, thank you, Christine. And thank